You can know a lot about God and not know him at all. How do I know? I grew up in a lot of wonderful environments where I learned a lot about God. In fact, who is God? God is the universe's creator and sustainer, plus the only savior. There is no one greater. He's trial and holy, omnipotent, omniscient, absolute loving, sovereign, and righteous. Those are a few of his attributes. How do I know that? Well, I know that from the Bible where God has revealed himself. Anything else is just an idol. You get the idea. Thanks, Shailen. See, we're not just meant to know a lot about God. We can get to know him personally. And in this study, I hope by the end, you don't just know a lot of facts about Jesus, but that you know him. See, because actually knowing someone requires personal knowledge coming from being with someone over time and building trust. Knowing about someone is just the first step, but it is an important step toward actually knowing them. And it's the same with God. So wherever you're at in your relationship with God, great. Be right there because as it turns out, God's not gonna meet you where you're not. So you might as well show up here to this study in this moment, right where you're at. And thankfully, God has made himself known to us through his word and through his son, Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John, the fourth account of the life of Jesus, was written by a guy named John, a disciple of Jesus, the one whom Jesus loved. The funny thing is that John wrote in his own gospel about himself that he is the one whom Jesus loved. John wrote that. Would you ever introduce yourself that way? It's kind of cute, right? Hey, I'm Megan, by the way. Nice to meet you all. I'm the one who <laughs> Jesus loves. The truth is you are. <laughs> You are the one whom Jesus loves too. And I hope you begin to believe that as we go through this study. So let's start there, friends. On this journey through the Gospel of John, a narrative all about God in the flesh who came because he so loved you and me and us. Believe it. You're loved so much so. You don't have to run around and search for it anywhere else in Christ. You have it completely, fully and eternally believe that about Jesus, believe all of his words about you, but also his own words about himself because see, that is why John wrote the book. In John chapter 20, 31, he gives us the precise reason when he writes this, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John is one of the four gospels following the life of Jesus. Like Matthew and Luke, John has his own genealogy of sorts, but his genealogy goes back before time even began. It's a genealogy of, well, eternity, a genealogy of the pre-existent one. What other writing in history can make this audacious claim? And John begins his gospel narrative by paralleling the beginning of the book, Genesis 1-1, when it is written in the beginning a time before time where there was just God, who, by the way, existed for forever. <laughs> we often consider the word eternity moving forward, but Genesis and John hint toward eternity in the past, a God who existed before the beginning. I can't quite comprehend that. God's always existed, but friends, I'm becoming more and more okay with a God I can't fully comprehend because a God I could fully comprehend would be a tiny God. And our God is bigger than I could ever imagine or think. And maybe it's good for all of us to hang out in that place of awe, that place where we can't fully know everything. It actually will lead us to a place of worship. It's good for us. So we begin at the beginning in John with the word. John chapter one, verse one says this, in the beginning was the word. What or who is the word? In Greek, the word is logos. Logos is the power and purpose of human life. See, while it was usually associated with an impersonal and abstract forces in the world, John intros his book by saying that that power and purpose and meaning for life's existence is not an abstract principle, it's a person. And this study will introduce you to him. If you want to know who the true God is, who exists eternally, look at Jesus, the Son. Colossians chapter 1, 15 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God. The invisible God is visible as we look to the life of Jesus. So you want to know what God's like? Good, look at Jesus. He's the main theme, purpose, direction, character of this fourth book in the New Testament. So what can we know 
about Jesus. Let's start with that knowledge. Well, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says that Jesus became flesh. He wanted to be with us, humanity, so much so that he becomes one of us. Why did he come? Why would God become flesh to dwell among us? Well, just two chapters later in John 3, 16, a famous passage, but receive it afresh, tells us why. Because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, by contrast, not in themselves, shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus came because God loved us and desired to give us eternal life with him for forever. My hope for you each week as we journey together through the book of John is that you will really get to know who he is in a personal and intimate way and then believe he is who he says he is. So we should get started with this question, who is he? The entire book of John teaches us about Jesus. So John begins the book with this critical proclamation revealing who Jesus is, God himself, and then gives story after story of the miracles, which John uniquely refers to them as signs, not miracles. And they're proving who he is. And then along the way, Jesus makes these seven I am statements explaining the character and nature of himself and of God. These are not Jesus's only statements about himself throughout the Bible and also in John, but they stand out in a unique way. They echo God's naming of himself all throughout the Old Testament book of Exodus, strengthening the link between the Father and the Son, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and ultimately providing a way for there to be an eternal link between God and us. It matters. So let's unpack this a bit. Why do we give someone or something a name? It's to identify, to distinguish, to characterize, describe, familiarize, but in a sense, and it's also to contain, to constrain, and even tame. You see, when I know someone's name, they become approachable. There's no longer a need to be held at arm's length. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. Imagine you were invited to Buckingham Palace to meet the Queen of England. You naturally would be a bit intimidated by the grandeur of the occasion. Can you imagine? if she pulled you aside into the sitting room, because they probably have one of those, sat down right next to you and said, oh, please call me Elizabeth. (laughs) That would certainly be disarming. You'd probably even relax a little bit and even feel like the distance between you and her had somewhat diminished. What then can we possibly call God? There is no name or moniker that can adequately characterize his essence, and any mere name would diminish his glory. Should he not rightly be held at arm's length? You see, we cannot and should not attempt to lessen the distance between ourselves and God. We must not in any way attempt to tame God. As Mr. Tumnus rightly said of Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia, he is not a tame lion and we err grievously and rob God of the glory due him when we attempt to do so. So what is the only name that can even approach giving God his due? Well, God told Moses that he should be called this. I am. This phrase in Hebrew can be translated a number of ways. I am, or I exist, or I am the eternally existent one or I am life itself. God is basically saying this, I am self-sufficient and self-existent. What this name communicates is that God is ever present, eternally unchangeable and everlastingly constant. Whatever it means to exist, God possesses this within himself. By contrast, maybe this will help. We are contingent beings. (laughs) We are dependent upon someone or something else for even our very existence and breath. God is not contingent or dependent upon anything else. He contains, defines, and possesses existence within himself. Is your mind rattling yet? (laughs) Anything that exists owes its very existence and its very ability to be to God. That is the starting place to understand the audacity of Jesus' claim for himself to be, I am. And what's most shocking of all is that this unapproachable being actually desires to know 
you and me. And in his sovereign, compassionate way, makes himself known to us. And he does it in such a profound way. The people around Jesus recognized what he was doing and saying, and they were more than offended. Why? Because Jesus was claiming all throughout the book of John to be God. And this becomes a stumbling block for some of the people and a source of contention and division for others. It was this assertion, these I am statements that ultimately led Jesus to his death. And again and again in John's gospel, we'll see the ancient people of God, specifically the rulers and self-appointed guardians of tradition, missing the meaning of what Jesus is doing and ultimately who he is because they refused to believe it could be true in him. And even many who did believe were too afraid of what everyone else would say to make their belief even known. It was actually many on the edges of society who were the ones who found themselves close to Jesus, forgiven, healed, brought in by God's transforming love. You see, for his true disciples, Jesus' claim to be God was eventually the very life-giving truth they clung to and gave their entire lives for. So where do you find yourself today? <laughs> There's just the intro, <laughs> just the beginning. Are you experiencing life in his name, longing for a deeper belief to give more of your life? Do you wanna be more in awe? Here's what I know. I just don't wanna be satisfied with whatever I understand to this point. Oh Lord, how we need you. We believe, maybe some of us believe. Oh Lord, would you just help us in our unbelief? Can we just stop for a moment in the midst of the Bible study and confess that we have so much more to believe? Let's never let this, well, I know, ever become our posture towards anything, towards our relationship with God, towards understanding him, toward our life, toward others, toward anything. We might miss out on knowing it more. You see, while there was no clear way Jesus could have said what we needed to know that he, he is Jehovah God, he didn't stop there. Instead, he continued to dive even deeper into revealing his nature and character by working purposeful signs and miracles that we're about to read about. I hope you're excited for the study. I am, clearly. But remember, signs, these signs, these miracles, what he's up to, signs always point to the purpose, the destination. They're a means to the end. And these signs are moments. They're moments when heaven is seemingly opened and when the transforming power of God's love bursts into the present world, we get to see what heaven, God's kingdom, is like. And what's it like? People are healed, fed, satisfied, brought to life. Jesus wants us to see more of himself through these signs and also these statements about himself. And we will come expectant, you see, because Jesus is the end. Therefore, let's let these signs and statements lead you to the treasure, my friends. Let them lead you to the word who became flesh, son of God, the promised Messiah. Each pronouncement reveals a new facet of his claim to deity. And this series, we're gonna be going through seven of them. And each of them is a key that unlocks a new door revealing his true identity. He is the one they had been waiting for, the word, the logos, Jesus himself, and by the Spirit of God, may we grow to believe and find life in his name too. What an unbelievable promise. Let's know him rightly and believe in him intimately. But we must know who he truly is. Kevin DeYoung once wrote a blog about the greatness of God being most clearly displayed in his son, Jesus. But he writes this, how many people know the real Jesus? He writes, there's all sorts of Jesus. I mean, there's Republican Jesus who's against tax increases and activist judges and for family values and owning firearms. There's Democrat Jesus who's against Wall Street and Walmart and for reducing our carbon footprint and spending other people's money. <laughs> there's therapist Jesus who helps us cope with life's problems, heal our past, tells us how valuable we are and not to be so hard on ourselves. There's open-minded Jesus who loves everyone all the time, no matter what, except for people who are not as open-minded as you. There's touchdown Jesus who helps athletes run faster, jump higher than non-Christians, and then determines the outcome of Super Bowls. 
There's martyr Jesus, a good man who died a cruel death so we can feel sorry for him. There's gentle Jesus who was meek and mild with high cheekbones, flowing hair, and walks around barefoot wearing a sash looking German. And he goes on, hippie Jesus, there's yuppie Jesus, spirituality Jesus, platitude Jesus, revolutionary Jesus, guru Jesus, boyfriend Jesus, and good example Jesus, who shows you how to help people, change the planet, become a better you. And then there's Jesus Christ the son of the living God, not just another prophet, not just another rabbi, not another wonder worker. He was the one they had been waiting for, and us too. The son of David and Abraham's chosen seed, the one to deliver us from captivity, the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh, the one to establish God's reign and rule, the one to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, proclaim good news to the poor, the lamb of God come to take away the sins of the world. This Jesus, who Kevin DeYoung wrote about, tells us precisely who he is seven times. And as I read this list, would you just quiet your heart for a moment with me and ask yourself, what do you need to hear about who he is? What do you need to believe? And so, by way of introduction, sit there quietly, close your eyes if you need, and imagine Jesus boldly declaring each I am statement that's coming forth, allow it to build anticipation for you to know and believe. Just after he feeds the 5,000, he tells the crowd that just as God gave the people bread out of heaven in the wilderness, that he too is that true bread of heaven. Jesus said this, I am the bread of life. Friends, he alone can provide for you and satisfy you. As they came to the festival of lights, Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. He's the original and eternal source of life and light in your life. In the midst of a parable about true and false prophets, a message that he was going, that was going way over their heads, Jesus says to them that the ones they're trusting to shepherd them are like thieves and liars and their purpose is to kill and destroy. And then he bluntly explains, I am the gate of the sheep and the only good shepherd, the only door to life. And I know and care for you. And as he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead, Jesus proclaims, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, he has the conquering power over death and its consequences. And in John 14, Jesus is simply answering a question. How do we know the way to God? Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the accessible path, the illuminating truth. He is the giver of life. And then in John 15, Jesus is teaching about abiding in him and uses this branch abiding in the vine. And then he declares, I am the true vine. I am the eternal source of life. Are you surprised by who he is? Are you allowing him to be these things in your life? Jesus Christ is not just to be a reflection of what we want him to be. He's not a vending machine or a projection of our own desires. No, as we'll find out in the book of John, he is Jesus Christ, son of the living God, savior of the world, more loving, more just, and as Kevin DeYoung wraps up, more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. And as you'll see, John's purpose in writing this book is that you might believe. This is a theme. The word believe, spoken at least a hundred times throughout the book, that's twice as much as the other three gospel writers combined. John wants us to not just know about Jesus, that he is these things, but that you would know him personally and believe that he is who he says he is. And to hit the statement, the purpose of writing the book, that by believing we, may undeservedly have life in his name, that we may live our lives in light of our belief in him. Dallas Willard put it like this, we don't believe something by merely saying we believe it, or even when we believe that we believe it, we believe something when we act as if it were true. As you read this week, let the Holy Spirit lead you into personal knowledge, into adoration, into honest prayer with him as we walk through his life and begin to experience life in his name together. So when you open yourself honestly to God and express the deepest parts of your heart in his presence, you will allow him to heal and to transform. And then watch this, 
to fulfill your deepest longings and desires in himself. So will you open yourself to the truth with me? Let's allow God to lead us together, to turn our lives toward Jesus, believe him, and find the life that he promises. Will you pray with me? Father, here we are. And as you're just even listening to this prayer, would you simply open your hands as a posture of an openness of your heart? Oh Lord, have your way in us. Illuminate the scriptures. Teach us how to love you and to receive your love, we pray. And all God's children said in unison, amen. Thank you.